everybody. How's it going? You all get points for being here on a Sunday. That's pretty cool. And uh, super points for being here on time. I appreciate it. What a packed room. This is awesome. Um, we got to give a big round of applause to FITC staff and volunteers. So cool. I was um, actually here yesterday all day setting up, and I did not realize how much work went into setting up an event. So I learned quite a bit during my time. So um, this is my third year being here. I'm super proud of that, and I'm really grateful that they brought me back for a third year. And I have to tell you guys, actually, I need a visual. It's hooked up. Ooh. Let's try. You got it? Okay. Whoa. -oh. So, one of my lessons is what to do when things go wrong. There we go. All right, we're back on. So, three years ago, I was here on this stage talking about content, right? And I thought I knew stuff about content, but what I didn't know actually bit me in the ass over the last three years. So I'm gonna show you a few stories and talk to you about a few ideas, and hopefully you guys can take away some lessons. Um, now, content is one of those words that I actually don't like. And before this talk, I was thinking like, what, can I, what word can I come up with to describe what content is? And I hate that word as, about as much as I hate the word creatives. Whoever the hell turned an adjective into a noun, I want to punch them in the face, but we're not going to get into that. Um, so my experience with creating Leviathan is basically that um, I wanted to create content that moves audiences. And now I understand that not all of you make video, not all of you uh, actually deal with projection mapping, but what I wanted to talk to you about is ways that you can actually improve your content. Some of you are writers, some of you are web developers, and so on. Um, I'm hoping that some of my stories will actually apply to some of the things that you're creating and you'll take something from it. So at Leviathan, what I've really uh, geared most of my work towards is actually live visceral experiences. And so what I wanted to show you guys is a quick cut. I made this specifically for you just to show you some samples of what we're doing here at our studio. Thank you. And so I've got good news for everybody in this room, no matter what you do, and that is that demand for content is rising. There is such a demand for good content that it, it keeps my business thriving and, and it definitely keeps most agencies I know thriving. And so the dialogue that I'm experiencing is one between my clients, these are my clients, um, amazing fashion, I love it, and my audience, right? And so the biggest thing that I hear, and I want you guys to like just raise your hands or shout if you hear these things coming from your clients, right? Add wow factor. Yeah, wow. Something no one has ever done before. I have to tell you, I hear this daily. My phone rings off the hook with people looking for something no one has done before. How about this one? Make it viral. It's kind of weird, isn't it? My favorite, blow their minds. That's kind of weird, too. Yes! All right, and your audience, your audience is hungry. 
And so again, no matter what you do, you need to think about your audience before you start working. Now your audience is saying things like this. I've never seen anything like this before. You say this too, right? And what motivates you to do something with that content is usually like, I gotta tell everybody about this, right? This is what makes you pull out your phone and post things, which leads me to this motivation. Everyone's gonna post when I flip this, you know? Um, and this one, OMG, you all say that. And that is that. <laughs> all right, but see, my point in all of this is you, especially the creative creatives in this room, is that you're responsible for leading the charge. Your clients come to you, your audience comes to you looking for solutions, and I believe that it's your responsibility to lead the way into the future. Something, that was something that I learned even back in high school. Um, my favorite art teacher actually walked up to me and she said, Jason, it's your job to show the way. I think I've told you all that before, and when I was 17, actually, like, it dawned on me. I was like, wow, I have a calling. All right, so since it's your responsibility, I need to know who you are. And I want you to make some noise when you hear your trade. What? Students? <laughs> Gotta admit, my favorite. I love you guys. What? Artists? <laughs> okay, okay. What? Animators? What, what, okay. Motion graphics, right? Okay. What? Designers. Okay. What? Programmers. <laughs> Engineers? Come on, Adam. Come on. What? Engineers, sorry. <laughs> um, producers. Okay, okay. Any managers in the room? Okay, all right. What? Musicians. Actually, photographers, any photographers in the room? Okay. What? Who's a fighter? <laughs> Who is all of the above? What? Okay. <laughs> did I forget anybody? If I did, come talk to me after this, because I want to improve this. Um, so a bit about me. I'm going to go back. Uh, trial and error. I had a, an interesting path getting to where I am now. And my path was actually um, starting and stopping a few studios. And my story is, when I was a motion designer, I really wanted to learn the business side of things. And what I did is, when I had the opportunity to build a few studios and build teams, I did it on someone else's dime. And I learned quite a bit from it. And it was a struggle to get there. So my first studio was called Lift Motion Design. Um, the, I, I launched it in 2006, and here's a, a picture of it. I have a net thing for interior design. Pretty nice. Um, we did a lot of poster design, a lot of other design. Um, and so as we grew, this is, this is some work from, I think, circa 2009. I grew it from just myself to 12 artists and just a few producers in just short five years. And, and during that time, I created hundreds of TV commercials in five years. And what I learned by making that many commercials under that much of a tight deadline was that A, content's king, for sure. And B, running a team is definitely a challenge. And so during that time, I made a name for myself as the guy who came up with concepts, right? And so I started doing boards for agencies, boards for Wrigley, boards for Samsung, Coca-Cola, all these guys. And then what happened to me I think towards the end of this is, I started to feel a calling towards interactive. I, I had done everything I needed to do. I was making this, I was shooting that. And the idea struck me that, what if I took this high-end content and I started applying it to stages? And what happens when you start taking that idea, and now this is 2009, broadcast video, on a mega stage and start doing things in the visceral world. There weren't that many people doing that and I thought for sure I'd become a millionaire if I do this. And so as I went, I had a resolve and I said, enough is enough. I need to get out there and I need to do this. So I started thinking about ways to do it. There was um, unfortunately a lot of friction within my own studio, and, and some people didn't want to go that route. So 
in 2010, during the worst part of America's recession, everything fell apart for me. I had to shut down my own studio and I went my own way. But the ones that came with me were the ones that were willing to adventure into this new territory. The ones that didn't go are the ones still making broadcasts and that's fine, they're happy doing what I do. But now, when I thank my team for venturing with me into the unknown without being scared, I truly thank them because they're not bailing on me, they're not crying or freaking out. So I quickly started to build my new studio and my new studio was going to be bigger than my last studio and the crew was gonna be awesome. <laughs> and we worked day and night to build this studio. We drained our savings. We risked everything to do what we had to do in America's worst economy that I'd ever seen. Um, I put my house on the line. I put my car on the line. I did everything. I called all my clients and I got it. I got it ready to go. I called it Leviathan because that's what I was feeling at the time. It didn't mean CVs or Satan's disciples or anything except for Motley Crue, but it did mean that this was my time. And so I evolved, I followed my dreams, and I built this cool space, and I designed it, and now this is what it looks like today. It's an open community where people can thrive. I have engineers sitting next to designers, sitting next to editors, sitting next to animators, and it's that community of evolution that I was seeking. And the sorts of projects we're working on, we have this philosophy, our founding philosophy is that we're going to make content our priority. So our engineers are on board with that idea as our designers are. So that's our company. Now, I'm going to show you guys a few projects. This one, um, I've never shown anyone, so let me know later what you think of this. Um, I have a belief that content is powerful, obviously, and it's the most effective way to communicate. So we were approached by the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago about this new project called Numbers in Nature. Any scientists in the room? Okay, okay, well let's nerd out. Okay, this is really fun. Um, this is what the exhibit looks like today. It is all about math and nature and how to make math cool. And what a, what a neat challenge, right? How to make math cool. I suck at math, I'm the worst. I can't even add something right now. But what I do like is the root of the story is actually based in things I knew in art school. Okay, so I got really excited about it. So these mathematical patterns um, made the basis for a really cool story to tell. And so these are just some of the things that we talked about with our client and just basically like wh what do these things look like in nature? And some of the stuff that we were talking about were actually like spirals and golden ratios. You're familiar with this stuff. Um, something that was actually new to me is Voronoi patterns and fractal branching. It's so exciting. And so we started building a system a visual identity system that would really flow across the entire exhibit as we, as we went about it. And we developed a kit, and this kit would be our foundation for all content that was to follow. Um, but where the content comes in is an introduction piece in a big theater where you walk through. And so a lot of these sort of um, identity systems and mathematical patterns are actually introduced through a two minute story. And then that story is actually relayed throughout the entire exhibit. The exhibit today looks sort of like this, and there's some stations, so after you go through the theater, you see things like that, and you play with things like this, where you get to get, have some hands-on experiences, and actually tweak some knobs, and um, make your own um, fractal shapes. So I've put together a quick case study. If you haven't seen it, I'd like to play it for you.
that's the lighter side of Leviathan, for sure. Okay, credits. All right, and so moving on, um, I firmly believe that if you're going to do something, you need to try to tell the best story you can to connect with your audience. And if you do so, you'll create a deeper emotional experience. Now, this is nothing new. We artists have been doing it since the beginning of making art. Um, you want to try to tap emotions out of people. And so I want to show you this project. Some of you are familiar with this. So when we were working with Amon Tobin on ISAM, how many of you have seen the live show? Okay, great. Um, Tobin, when he approached us, he was working on his seventh album. And it was an awesome album. It's called ISAM. And it was a conceptually deep exploration of sounds. And, and he had stories to go along with it. He was working with an artist called Tessa Farmer, and they were creating art shows, and the art shows had a narrative. I rarely have clients come to me with such a developed story and idea, and so he was putting out these EPs, and he was putting out his album cover with these ideas. And so at the core of all of our conversations was actually art and story. Um, but what made this project really cool is that Tobin wanted to create a cinematic experience like no other. And again, what does a client come to you and say? Do something no one has ever done before. So this was actually my first big project at Leviathan, and I had never done this before. They had never done it before, but we jumped into it. But so, story was at the center. Here's the deal. There was an element of fiction that Tobin was weaving into this, and, and it was kind of cool because he wanted to be an archetypal hero of his own space journey. So he came up with this idea to wear an extremely hot, NASA uniform that he actually sweats in inside of the box. It's kind of funny. Um, and so I'm going to play a really quick video for you just to give you, those of you that don't know about this project, just to give you a primer. to my story about uh, migrating from a broadcast studio into this new experiential studio, for me, being in that audience, seeing the people flip out watching this sort of broadcast quality content on a stage for the first time was so gratifying to me because I knew that the plan would work uh, as we move forward. And so I wanted to just rewind to the very beginning, and, and I'll kind of just go through these quickly. Um, when you're thinking about story, right, you want to actually look at your coloring book and start thinking about where you're going to apply this story. And so we started approaching it much like a broadcast ad at that time. And like much of you, most of you know, you want to start with references and look at what you're into. And our common sort of theme for this whole thing was actually science fiction. So uh, Giger, rest in peace, um, was a big inspiration. Um, and we started looking at sort of like space nebulas and um, contemporary design and trying to figure out ways to fuse those together. And also just things like holograms and um, you know, futuristic looks. And so these are the early boards. And I was actually taking my broadcast point of view. And I knew many people weren't doing this. And we were actually plotting it out. And so you'll see the stage there. But we went through a couple different themes um, so we can sort of figure out the animation and the color palette. 
and everything went from sort of a choreographed mentality. So we're going from blue to brown, back to blue, so we can understand where we're moving through this, uh, these different spaces so he can tell his story. Um, everything from abstract and colorful to dark and moody. Um, and then, you know, the cosmically strange where we take everyone on a trip. So the show was a success, no doubt. I mean, it was a big deal. But so by the time he went on to build another stage, I love this, yay, we made it bigger times two. So what, what this does is whenever you can expand your real estate, you get more uh, information to play with. And what was working for me just as a creative director was the fact that I had um, anything that was sympathetic to the shape of the stage was working. So we decided to take it further into the art territory and try to do this again, trigger some emotions. And one of the best ways to speak to people's own fantasies and illusions is actually use real stuff. So we try to do, again, something no one's ever done before and get practical with it. So we decided to invite uh, a local creative team, uh, Red Moon Theater, and these guys create large-scale dangerous public works in Chicago. They burn things down, they do all kinds of crazy stuff, and they're also, they build sculptures. And so as we started to go across the new ideas, we started to actually plan it out like a play. And the core uh, idea behind this is that Tobin himself was having a dream about building a toy. And this toy is a wooden toy, and it would go on to try to not only kill him, but destroy the world. Kind of neat, kind of crazy, but would make it work. And so we decided to turn the stage into wooden crates and figure out all these kooky ideas. But we actually wrote acts for this. And as a design studio, I'm not a writer, but we started writing our play out. And we started divvying it up and divvying up the story. Um, so each box had its own little special thing going on. Now, at that time, I was revisiting Brothers Quay, and I got really excited about doing some animation um, with that. And so some of the early drawings were actually about making sculptures inside of these boxes. But then we started saying, how can we make the sculptures inside of these boxes move and then figure out ways to trick the audience into uh, sort of like a peekaboo what's behind each door. And so here's some early shots of us in production um, actually manually operating the content that goes into the boxes. And what the camera sees is actually a straight on view of the box content. A shot of us actually recording it so we can port it into um, our 3D program. And this was really just an excuse for us to make a total mess. And I think everyone on our staff was pretty much fighting to use matches and burn things and use oil and light the studio on fire. So uh, would you guys like to see a case study on that one?
One thing I've learned through all of this is that mega scale equals mega impact, and bigger is actually sometimes better, as much as I hate to admit it. John Deere came to us right after that, and what they wanted was the ISOM show. And the one thing I've learned is that monumental experiences work. So what we did is we proposed a 200-foot stage. Now, this is for a product launch event where they would show quite a few projects. 20, uh, 26 products, I believe, come out in procession across the stage, and it would be a projection map thing. Um, and you know, the idea here, again, back to broadcast, back to all of that sort of stuff, is just tell a story of innovation. And we worked so hard on this story, and it's a 45-minute show. How do you make John Deere interesting for 45 minutes? Actually really interesting as far as the technology is concerned. So we actually plotted it out in sections, much like our other shows. And so some of my boards, I'll just kind of briefly go through these. The choreography was very important. If you're all in the stage and you're looking at a 200-foot stage, for me as a director, it's very important where your eye's going and how to lead the eye. So we, we just burned ourselves trying to figure out that out. But it's also, again, back to Tobin, how do you uh, transition between light and dark and color and all of that? And so we actually went into quite a bit of information with this. And the end result was actually their brand guideline coming to life. And you designers would understand what that's like tons of information. And then it switches into night mode, sexy glam mode, super hotness. And then it would go into footage, full 8K footage across the whole screen. And then again, transitions and um, going forward. And of course, a beautiful logo at the end. Here's a quick case study about that one. success. <laughs> so like I was saying when I started out talking, the one thing I've learned in the last three years since I first met you all is that you can't always get what you want. And I've learned some pretty hardcore stories um, about telling, um, I've, I've learned some pretty hardcore lessons about this. And so I get a little choked up. I'm getting choked up just talking about this because this is one of those things that um, was really hard for me. Um, I was actually recovering from a surgery in 2013, and I was really broken up about that. And I was um, in the hospital for weeks, and I lost a lot of weight, and my morale was shot. I was shot. I, I didn't think I'd ever get back to where I was. And so there I'm in the hospital, and I get a call from my studio producer, and he actually says, hey, HBO is looking for us. They got a new show. It's called True Detective. Do you want to talk to them? <laughs> yeah, I want to talk to them. OK. Let me get my shit together, get out of this hospital, go home, get ready. I'm shaking, guys, at this point. I'm shaking. I get on a call with HBO. There I am, on a call with HBO. And 
some of the stuff that was coming out of them, there were like eight executives on these calls, you know what that's like, everybody's shouting out references, flashbacks, maps, Texas, rural, green, prostitution, abandonment, blah, blah, blah. Have you guys seen the show, True Detective? It's fucking awesome, right? All right, and so also, like any other project, we're looking at references, and I'm trying to decode what all this means. And so this is about Petro America. It's a very dark and dirty world that they're living in. I said, yes, I'm going to pitch on this. If it takes everything, I'm going to do it. So I came up with ideas, and I pitched it. And so <laughs> there I was, talking to HBO execs. It was down to me and one other company. And this is my first major title sequence. And the reason I'm telling you guys about title sequences is because I actually decided to do something I've never done before, get into title sequences, because if I can do this, then my experiential work will get better. All right? So I'm talking to HBO. I'm pitching these ideas, right? And a lot of these ideas were things that they wanted to see, but I didn't know at that time that these are things that I wanted to do. And so here's my ripped paper look where we're going through petrochemical America. Here's, here's, uh, here's Woody uh, looking at some breasts, which is kind of funny. Um, and then again, ripped paper, and this is all about an effect, but there was no story to it. Um, one of my favorites was called Remember Nowhere, and this is about driving through petrochemical America, the South, looking through a window. Um, you know, the titles go by, look at this, it's beautiful, right? The guys on the phone were like, seen it, done it, next, what's next? And I was like, okay, great. Um, I, I, all right, what about this one? Um, this one's all about photography, and it's about the search for a killer. And as you go through it, um, evidence is revealed and so on. And um, we'll go down to the south, and we'll shoot all these pictures, and it'll be great, and, and Matthew will look really beautiful and all that, blah, blah, blah. No, we don't, we don't like that. Okay, what else you got? All right, motion graphics. Everyone likes cutouts, blah, blah, blah. We're going to go into this. Techniques, when confronted about that, um, they basically... They were really into this one. They said, oh, man, we really like that. Why don't you uh, take that and combine it with something else? So I, I did, and these are like the second set of boards. Um, and what we came up with was this really cool motion graphics look that would be based on everything they said. And so I tried to put it all in there and come up with something that would be really cool. And it went on. And then they said, we like crosshairs. What about crosshairs? So I said, OK, <laughs> we can put crosshairs in there. And we'll do this, and we'll do that. And the thing is, you know, I didn't really have an answer when they said, what, is, what does it really mean? I was on the call with the head guy, uh, you know, these guys, and, and basically I didn't have an answer. I didn't know what it meant. I just knew that, A, I was proud of myself for kicking a surgery and I was fighting back, and B, that I was really trying my best and I was having my team all rally around me to try to figure it out. But, you know, it didn't happen. And so what I learned is, you know, number one, don't, don't listen to all the cooks in the kitchen. And there were a lot. And I'm not dissing HBO and I'm not dissing my team, but there were a lot of cooks. And you know what it's like when you listen to everybody? I should have listened to myself because I knew what was going on when it happened. And also, they shot holes in every one of my ideas. And I did not have enough time or preparation time to prepare that. So, my lesson is to definitely solidify your concept before you apply design. Um, and so here's the final.
guys see familiar elements in the final? They had the same directive. That was Studio Elastic. They did a very nice job with that. Um, but what I learned from that, every pitch there out, I actually play music. I stand up in front of the clients, or I, I, I do like a web conference thing, and actually play the music that will be in the final. And I try to draw as much emotion out of everybody I can. And that piece taught me a huge lesson. So I got back, though, revenge. I, um, I bounced back immediately. Um, and then the one thing I learned from this is you need to rally your passion. You need to get behind what you do best and be honest about that. And so what I do best actually is art, and I decided to do something very artful. The next time somebody calls me, and Sundance called me, I got an op opportunity to work on this one um, called Red Road. I'm going to give you a quick, quick um, sort of synopsis of what it is. It's basically it's about two clashing communities. This is a summer of like the pressing drama for me. Um, I'm going to play a very quick uh, trailer. I did not cut this. Um, intense shit, right? It's crazy. So I immediately uh, knew that I was up against some very stiff competition. There were eight studios bidding on this. So again, got my team together. And the rule this time is we'll look at references, but nobody's making a frame until we draw. And so I made everybody draw with pencil and paper the way I do. And some really neat ideas came out of it. So skipping ahead from the drawings, we were looking at references, again, of um, very um, dark and strange things that were rooted in and sort of the mystery of the show. And so the board started to develop and rooted in the elements of the show, we started actually looking at things that would be in the native territory um, for the Ramapo territory. And some of the boards that started to develop are things that I felt very strongly about and, and they were rooted in art. And so I started indulging in exotic dark ideas about paint sludges and really just, I don't know, sensual things that I wanted to do. And we also got into illustrative techniques. And, and again, this is what our studio does better than shooting. So again, back to animation, back to things we feel comfortable with. And my team started getting really excited because this was rooted in motion graphics. And so I, I put together these boards and I felt really good about this. So I went out one night and I'm at, I'm at an industry thing and I'm drinking, you know, like we all do. And something hit me and I had this idea like in the middle of hanging out and um, I had a conviction. And so if something happened to me, I actually threw my beer down. It was that moment where you're like running back to your studio because you have a thing you gotta do and it was due the next day, right? And so I, I went back at night, I had a kind of a buzz on and I started drawing and the idea was so damn simple and it was about a journey, a Native American that's going on a, a sort of like a soul journey after he's passed to find his quest. And so I started drawing, and it, all it was is a simple red line. Duh, obvious, yeah, but I didn't see that before. And so I sat up all night, and I drew, and I drew, and I figured it out. And then my team got on board, and we quickly made boards, and we quickly got it together. And it's deceptively simple, but it's sort of complex. And you know what happened next? Yeah. I got it. Sundance was elated and they could connect with it because I presented it with so much conviction. I poured my heart out. I wrote a story. I beat all seven other studios. So it's no true detective, but I'm proud of it. It's a quick 30. Um, look for a little hidden um, strange things in the drawings. I'm going to play the final for you. Thank you. Thank you. One anecdote about that actually was that at, at some point, one of the uh, one of the guys on the Sundance side was freaking out. That I don't know if we can do this. I don't know if we can air this. And much to my credit, my story was so together that I had to get on a conference call and actually convince them, convince them that this is the right thing to do because I told them my story again and I actually had to remind them why we all committed to do this. So again, the story saved the damn day. All right, so things I think you should write down. 
And I hope you agree with me that great con content can captivate. Um, and so I have a checklist, and I just wanted to kind of expose this. I've never really shared this with you, but this is what I go through, what my studio and I go through. Every time the phone rings, people looking for stuff, is we ask ourselves, what is this project really about? And what that means is, what's the story? What is the core of the idea? And what are your clients trying to do? Are they trying to sell things? Are they trying to change the world? So on. You really need to ask those questions. And does it have good, good story potential? I can't tell you how many projects I turn away because I don't think in the end the story will support it. It'll just be blinky lights on a stage, right? Um, and also, how will it benefit my audience? How will it benefit the world I live in? You really need to think about this as an artist. What are you contributing to and how is it going to better everything you do? And you know, going through all these experiential projects, you, you want your audience to walk away with a lasting impression. So you actually succeed and they succeed. It's a very good move. And one of the last things you should be thinking about is, will it improve my portfolio? What will this do for my portfolio? Will it help me or will it hurt me? As a creative director, that's my main job for my studio, is to make sure that I'm following the path and I cannot tell you how many jobs I actually decline because I don't think it will make the cut. And so you really need to acknowledge that versus just chasing a job for the money. Um, and, and another thing I think that makes Leviathan a little bit different, obviously you've seen all of our documentation. As you go through everything, if you document your work, you're only going to further that story when it's time to tell that story in your portfolio. When I'm hiring people, I look for that narrative and that thread. Again, concept first, how many of you have seen a really, a really bad expensive movie? multi-billion dollar movie. It's, it's crazy, right? Because their concept wasn't locked down, it, it, it just doesn't mean it won't, you know, it won't touch anybody. Um, partnering up is, is something that I evangelize. I believe in it. I, I know not everybody in here does projection mapping. I actually uh, have an amazing staff of engineers. I don't touch a lot it's of it. It's three o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, Amon Tobin's a perfect example of partnering up. That cat knew to reach out to people that knew how to do what he does not, and, and that's what made him successful. And so I, I firmly, firmly believe even students, you know, the best thing you could do is team up with people because it only makes your portfolio better. Okay, it's three o'clock. So um, I'm giving another talk, I'm doing a double header. I'll be in the Carmichael room. I'm giving a talk about how to survive the creative industry. I've never done this before, but um, I've got some pretty hardcore lessons. It's completely unplugged and unscripted. So I hope to see you there. Thank you.